everyone, we are from the 12th meeting group and today we would like to show you our presentation about the public sphere, navigating opposing agendas in an age of absurdity. But before we start, I would like to introduce our group members. There are Aditya Anggoro, presentation number 1, Aziza Safira, presentation number 10, and myself, Nelvna Dermawan, presentation number 33. So, let's begin the presentation! The public sphere makes most sense when viewed in the context of a dialectical relationship with the private sphere. In the chapter 1 of this book, Hannah Arendt was a strong advocate for a healthy public sphere within society. Arendt wrote, The public realm gathers us together and yet prevents us from falling over each other. Hannah saw that modern society is replacing the public sphere by the social and experience not unlike a spiritualistic CNC where a number of people gathers around a table might suddenly, through some magic trick, see the table finish from their midst so that two persons sitting opposite each other are no longer separated but also will be entirely unrelated to each other by anything tangible. After the World War II ended, the friendship between chemists and star grades seemed to be fall apart. The different point of view of what to do after the war seems to be more dominating. While chemists thought that we have to help a rebellion to create meaning where none previously existed, Sartre think that we have to adapt in the age of absurdity. Their inability to maintain their relationship in the face of absurdity represented a fall into an existential homelessness. In 1951, Camus republished his book entitled The Rebel. In a meeting with Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre warned Camus that his book will be reviewed by Modern Times, which is Sartre's platform, but the review would not be a positive evaluation. Jensen's review entitled Albert Camus or the Soul of Revolt began by summarizing the positive reviews the book-length philosophical essay The Rebel had received from the most diverse thinkers. Although the publication of The Rebel served as the focus of Jensen's review, he aimed his first criticism at Camus's novel The Plague, which recounts events as seen from on high by non-situated subjectivity that didn't leave those events itself but merely contemplated them. Jensen felt that Camus's latest work would prove that he will cease being historically situated consciousness. Jensen's most stinging criticism was that The Rebel was a great failed book. He concluded by challenging Camus' return to the personal voice that had made him irreplaceable to us. Narrative Camus begins by not offering an apology for giving an opinion about the rebellion that is well received by those on the right and placing his concern for truth rather than political affiliation. Camus attacks Jensen, referred to as your collaboration, and suggests that he emphatically refused to discuss the major thesis found in, his, in this region. Camus believed what the Jason had completely missed the point. Camus believed he should be responsible only for what he said he would do and not for what he did not try to achieve. He concluded by stating that the initial review would invite his response. Also, the personal nature of the attack was a characteristic of the exchange. Camus' focus remained on the action required in an abstract moment. Narrative engagement. Camus' main criticism is aimed at his denial of socialism as part of the evolution of the historical invincibility. Form of history, Camus was gripped by a set of assumptions that differed from that motivation by many of his contemporaries. After the debate ended, Camus' silence might reveal the recognition that a strong vocabulary for describing his involvement was not yet present and that dominant vocabulary, the idiosyncronic vocabulary of Maxim and historical invincibility one day. 
Francis Jesus voice scholar that Camus was only providing a physical exploration of revelation and sees him for not embedding his exploration of revelation in historical event. Camus himself what that his aim was to provide an analysis of the ideological dimension of the revelation and that he had conveyed what he wanted to provide. By addressing this letter, their editor Camus and Fight started to his version this attack on standard philosophies and politics. Also so much for him to ignore and his response to Camus emerged in August 1952. Narrative In contrast to Camus' cut opening, Sater was his letter near Camus, he realized that his exchange in a public context most likely mark the end of their relationship. His opening words to his answer were, Our relationship is not easy, but I will miss it. Sartre at say Camus believed as a writer should pursue book only professional philosophy of sophistication in competence. Even so, Camus considers himself a poet more than a philosopher that in so remains painful. Sartre reinforced his attack on Camus' philosophical assemblages. I have at least this in common with Hegel. You have not read any of us. There will be ending the, the communication between Sartre and Camus. Sartre concludes with, I will not reply to you again. I refuse to fight you. Hopefully, your son will make this polygamic forgotten. Sartre exits the conversation and Camus is next silent remaining focused on the control issues of this debate. Narrative in judgment, Camus did not have a vocabulary agent Sartre, but had a literary heart that believed more in a philosophy to come. A philosophy that had not yet been articulated, Camus literally hurt my life by a word which the invincibility of his story no longer creates. The word is hot. The silence of Camus is the silence driven by that one word censored philosophical and pra pragmatic characteristic Camus might like the vocabulary to counter such a attack but Trinsert offers support for Camus' position. This public debate for sure in Ilson that Sartre is a different of mixed ideas. Also, the accent illustrates that ideas should be understood and discussed at some point there are limits to one participant in a, the conversation. Certain communication philosophies can help profit insight into the whole a person's life and is involved in certain moments. Camus strife, which ended his friendship with Sartre, was driven by difference in philosophical belief, which were more theoretical in nature. Just profiting this frequent their disagreement, but it is also driven by different in political and ethical belief that are played out in everyday life. The publication of the rebel simulated public conversation between Camus and Sartre during the 19th and 50th and the began an exchange that eventually led to the end of the two men's friendship of nearly 10 years, the breakdown of interpersonal relationship in moments of narrative class and virtue in one of many potential considerations. Okay. Rehabilitating the public of speech in an age of absurdity. An age of absurdity lacks a common center that can be considered an inherited, understood, and active philosophical and practical set of assumptions and actions that great of people. The published exchange between Albert Camus and Jean Paul Sartre provides a vivid account of the consequence of taking action in the midst of absurdity. In, in vernacular voice, the rhetoric of public and public speech also built upon the work of Arendt and Habermas, 
urging that people need a model of public spirit that accommodates public issues, publics, and the publicness of public life as something not identical with or preferred intimate existence. But Hauser acknowledged the limitation of democratic culture in which everyone has the ability to provide input to decision and public conversation. Responsibility is set by both those who are evaluating the temperature of the conversation and those who are participating in the conversation. Conclusion the conversation between Camus and Sartre provides a 20th century case of study of conversation about the metaphor of absurdity and rebellion to topics that are incapable of sustaining a long-term conversation because they lack content. Although the circumstances propelling the conflict have dramatically changed over the past 50 years, many connections can still be made between the historical moment of the debate and the contemporary postmodern moment. Camus and Sartre were at odds in the debate because they lacked the necessary material that could have served as a foundation for continuing differences. This very public breakdown of the relationship, the prison of war for Camus, and invite a conversation about how one can identify with another and to what one is responsible.